Uh, now we're going to move into reports just for CTCs, where Doug has already talked about them for universities. So I think he, he can focus on the issues on these reports that are specific to the community and technical colleges. Okay. okay. And those from universities who want to leave us are welcome to, to head on out. Thank you all for joining us. Talk about the, C, uh, the student report, CBM01. Um, of course, it reflects all students enrolled at appointing institutions as of the official census date. Uh, again, demographic data is collected. Um, definitely census date report. Uh, it is used in success point calculations, and it is used in the accountability system and any CTC reports where student information is required. Um, and here's the report layout, um, and we'll dive right into the four, um, which is the class report. And again, reflects conditions as of the official census date and, and will report all students enrolled in coordinating board approved academic and technical courses for which semester credit hours are awarded. Uh, we collect information about the classes taught, semester credit hours, contact hours, location, instructor, et cetera. Uh, enrollment by level, affected or not affected by the SCH limit. Uh, again, census date report uh, used in the formula funding calculations and use, also used in the accountability system and any other CTC reports uh, where it's required. Um, one thing I wanted to add to that, though, is this fall um, we finally um, got the um, academic course guide on a, on a uh, database. So some of you may have seen our, some of our testing accidentally slipped in uh, over the past couple of weeks. And we will be um, verifying that the, um, the class, the course and the course number and the SIP code are all on the academic course guide manual. Um, what we found in some of our testing is that um, most people report the classes just for the class name and, and number fine. The problem is, is, is it looks like the SIP codes kind of get changed up, like uh, English 1301 may have an English 1304 SIP code or vice versa. Um, so that's something I think the way, the only way we're going to be able to remedy that um, is what we're looking at is, is uh, running some queries over what you reported in the fall and spring, you know, deduplicate the, the courses and just to make sure, show you, send them out and show you what you um, may not be reporting correctly. Uh, this also uh, would affect the CBMOS, but since the four is reported beforehand, it'll probably help you clean things up. Um, anyway, here's the layout. Uh, again, we've got CBMO 1 and 4 contact hour and semester credit hour checks. Um, the academic courses reported on the 1 must be within 250 hours of the contact hours reported on the 4. Um, in technical courses, it's still 250 hours. And then the academic semester credit hours, uh, which apply to the undergraduate limit reported on the 1, must be with 100 hours of those reported on the 4. Um, again, address all year-to-year -year review items on your edit reports when you send in your certification request. Uh, are there any questions on that? We had a couple from the field, too. You wanted to. Um, I have a question. I'm from Alamo, and we have five colleges separately accredited. We report separately. And we have the restricted nursing programs at two of the institutions. And we're in one database, so we share our students. They might be enrolled in the nursing program at one of the colleges and then be taking an academic course at the other. Mm -hmm. And the way our reporting is, we have to um, change their major for the non-restricted um, colleges. So if at one school they're in the nursing and they go over and take the academic at the other, 
that other college has to change the subject major to be liberal arts in order to resolve the error that's created. Okay. Is there anything that we could do about that? We may be able to do that. Um, and in some of the other multi uh, campus like San Jack and Lone Star and all that, um, we, I, th I believe the in the program it'll go through and it'll look for um, well, so this, uh, so I guess this must be, we must be hitting against the, our, the, um, I guess the program of the clearinghouse inventory, yes. correct? Okay. So I believe we do that on some of the other ones. Um, I, I don't know that it's, uh, well, I guess because y'all were all separate at one time, everything was pretty much done separately. Yes. But now you're more together. We have a single database. Okay. So we may need to look into that. Would you send me an email sure. with that? So we'll, what we'll do is basically we'll look for it. If we don't find it, we'll probably um, look at it at a district type level against all the rest. Yes? I was gonna ask regarding the review items. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it has 50%. Sometimes there's some items that are over 50% or over 100% and they don't say review. So we don't have to address those. We only have to address the ones that say review, no matter what. That's correct. What, what uh, probably those items you're looking at may be um, you had 10 students and now you have 15 students in the next year. And, you know, yeah, it's 50%, but I mean, five more students in the, you know, in that um, program or whatever really isn't a big deal. I'm not sure how, I think we went to a, a minimum amount, you know, type deal. If it was less than 10 students, maybe, or less than 20, and then it went up to a certain amount, we didn't, uh, we wouldn't flag those. That one that you're talking about is the one that I did get a flag on, and it was like from one student to two students. Oh, and really? it, it did have a review. That's why I, it's kind of, right. it doesn't make sense. So that's why I was trying to say. So you want you want to review more things? No, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> I do not, but that one had a review by it. Okay. But it was because one more student that's, you know, that's was, interesting. was in that I, category. I, I wonder if that just kind of slipped in, because typically um, I wouldn't expect that to, to show up. Can you send me an email to, on which thing it was? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. We had two questions from the field, short ones. One wanted to know what they had to do to submit success points, and we calculate the success points at the coordinating board. So you just have to submit your regular reports, and we go ahead and calculate the success points from here. So that's easy. Someone else also asked about uh, how we determine first time in college. We use the information that you provide to us to do first time in college. We use that FTTR field uh, that comes in on the CBM 001. That's the first time in college or first time transfer uh, and if it's first time in college we as I explained before and I don't want to do, do it in detail again we will also go back and we will include everyone reported to us as first time in college if we're for example running a fall cohort but we'll also just for our fall cohorts look back and see if you reported to someone to us as first time in college in the summer um, so that's how we do it, we do not make a decision. Um, we, we look at the first time in college and we use that what you've reported to us for the cohorts. Now a lot of things like grad rates are run on first time full time, so you're unlikely to have someone who's first time full time in a fall at a community college and a university. Usually they'll be full time at one and maybe taking additional courses, so even if the place that told us they're taking a few courses reported them, we won't be capturing them in those first time full time cohorts, but we do use the information you give us, but as I explained before, we look back to the summer, and that's why it's very important if someone's with you in the fall, if they were somewhere else in the summer, but they really are truly first time in college, um, you need to let us know that in the fall. We've got another question in the back. When you're looking at the um, review items, how specific do we need to be in our justification, or how general can we be? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, we just really need to know that you've, you've really looked at them. Um, and you know, uh, we really don't want to see, yeah, yeah, yes, this accurately reflects what we have. You know, 
we really want to see, um, you know, uh, like uh, the example I was using, uh, a program has gone up 35 percent in 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 uh, in number of students in that program, and you know, it, it would be really the best thing we'd like to see is to say, you know, we. Um, we opened up, uh, you know, we were able to uh, hire more instructors to teach in this program, and therefore we were able to have more enrollments. Or, you know, we had we went out and, and uh, tried to recruit more students for it, and, uh, you know, this is showing a great success on it or something like that. And I also want to add, even if something is not flagged, it's... You know, it, you understand the context of what your numbers look like. You understand your data. And if you don't, there's there are people at your institution that do. And if your enrollments, you know your enrollments are down 5%, and they show they're up 3%, you know, you show a 3% increase, and it's, it's not flagged because it's not a very big percentage, you should still know something's wrong here. This, does, this doesn't look right. And the more you can understand, you know, and if you're not someone in institutional research, you know, make sure you work with the people who know what the numbers should look like. If you're reporting the 002 and you have no idea what happens in DE and who's ready or not from the assessment folks, make sure those people get a chance to see what's coming in. Use the people you have, the people who understand the data, as reviewers whenever possible. Um, and you'll learn through that process, too, in terms of the context of what's being reported, because you can save everyone a whole lot of time if you pick up problems, even if they're not something that we pick up on the standard, hey, are we off by 25%? If you can pick up anything that just doesn't look right, it's hugely helpful to get that in the process. So I really encourage people not just to look at those that come in as questionable or those that come in as, you know, very different from the year before, but just look at all the data, look at everything in the summary and make sure it makes sense in terms of what you know about your institution and, and your numbers. Good. That's my pitch for the day. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, and, and all of this does go into calculations for, uh, you know, money for your institution. Uh, yeah. So the best, best to, to report it accurately as possible. Yeah, and you know, the compliance folks will come around and want to want to see the numbers. And really, it's it's uh, you you play an important role in catching things. Um, so consider yourself, we have someone on the staff who calls himself the data detective, and just consi consider yourselves, da his name is David, so doctor, he's a doc Dr. David, the data detective. Um, so, da But he does a wonderful job of figuring out wh wh why doesn't this look right, and what isn't happening here, and that really should be the role that all of you play, and it, 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 it can be fun. I'm thinking of a TV series, but we'll see. <laughs> Um, and, okay, so now uh, Anissa Wagner will will uh, tell us about the CBM09. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, like Doug said, my name is Anissa Wagner. I'm one of the data analysts uh, who work on the CBM CBM. Um, CBM reports for community and technical colleges. And thank you all for being here. So I'll be doing a brief overview of the CBM 009 graduation report, and I'm going to pray that my PowerPoint works here. Okay, what does the CBM 009 include? The CBM 009 include degrees and certificates, <clears throat> which have been awarded to students in active coordinating board approved um, programs during the fiscal year. Also included are progress measures of students who have completed the core curriculum and are approved fields of study. The degree and certificate program approval codes for academic, technical, and continuing education programs must be on the education and training clearinghouse technical programs inventory. For short, we'll call it to the uh, technical program clearinghouse or inventory. If a student is awarded an associate degree and a certificate concurrently, a separate record for each award must be submitted. Each progress measure uh, will be submitted in a separate record, but only once for each specific measure. So for example, uh, if you have a student who earned an AAS and a core completer in the same year, you will report those records separately. Um, the due date for the CBM 009 report is October 15th. As institutions a re, uh, participating in the nursing shortage reduction program are required to submit their uh, nursing graduates by October 1st. The nursing graduates must be error-free uh, to be included in the count for funding. Uh, 
the remainder of the CBM 009 reports, I'm sorry, the remainder of the CBM 009 records may be included in the submission with the nursing graduates or they may be submitted in accordance with the October 15th uh, due date. All graduates, including nursing graduates, must be on the final certified file. Okay, this is, uh, there currently are 11 approved field of study curricula with zip codes and parameters, and you can find them on page 9.2 of the CBM manual. And I wanted to point out that uh, last year, the criminal justice field of study, uh, the zip changed to 430104. And I, if I can interrupt, we have had some legislation that's going to focus on field of study. So I think we're, we'll see some maybe expansion there, and it's going to be really important that institutions report those. And I think we'll probably see some expansion also in terms of existing fields of study. So that, that's important. Okay, so now I want to talk about multiple, multiple awards. There's an edit check on the 009 edit program to identify reporting of multiple awards in excess of the number of award types within level and SIP approved on the technical program inventory. And a lot of people tend to miss this on their edit report. They certify and then they have these multiple awards. So they're found after the item number on the first page of your edit report. You'll see the multiple awards in excess of clearinghouse to be reconciled. And if it's anything other than zero, you want to come down on your edit and right above your awards, and, and I'm sorry, right, abo right above your errors and your questionables, you'll see um, the multiples, multiple awards. And there, it lists the number of awards reported. For example, the first one is two, and then you want to verify the, the program clearinghouse where there it says uh, the number of awards in uh, the clearinghouse is only one certain one. So you want to remove that extra record for that student. Does that make sense? Okay, and one of the common errors uh, found on the CBM 009 is the major item nine not found on the clearinghouse. And I just wanted to list some of the items that you want to check to make sure that they are coded properly. So item eight, level of award, item nine, the major, and item 13, the type of award. And last but not least, please justify all review items when you certify your reports, as Doug have been saying all along. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do we have any questions? Okay, no questions. Okay. <laughs> Well, I, I want to thank Anissa, who volunteered to present one of the reports and, and, you know, take a little of the workload away from Doug and me. So excellent job. Thank you so much for, for doing that, Anissa. First time presenter, so please don't judge. No, you did a wonderful <laughs> job. Thank you. And many of you know Anissa because she does uh, work with you on your, on your reports. I will. Okay. Yes, Ruth Sproul, St. Phillips College, San Antonio, Texas. Yes. I do have a question uh, for clarification on the nursing shortage reduction. Those are schools that are in that grant for the nursing shortage reduction? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Good. That was good. Okay, I, I see that it's 4 o'clock, and we have a couple of reports left. We actually did these in the order we did them in because in case we didn't get to everything. We are going to stay and work through the rest of the reports. I know some of you are here for TACRO tomorrow, and it's a little early for dinner, so you'll, you'll stick with us. If you do need to leave, uh, feel free to do so. We, we thank you so much for joining us because we did say we'd be through at 4. Um, and I realized when we a, a little while ago that we didn't put a we didn't do an evaluation form, but this is kind of our first time to try to do a big training with lots of manuals all at once and with a very diverse audience. So if you do have any comments for how we could improve this or if we should target it differently, um, feel free to send an email to me or to Jana. We provided Jana's email address, or mine is just julie.eckland at thecb.state.t. US, because we would like your feedback. If this sort of thing is helpful to just have everyone in one room and to talk and share questions, we'd like to know that. If we really feel like we should stick with, I mean, we were thinking more in terms of beginners, but we wanted to also give everyone a chance to ask questions. But if we should do something that this is really for beginners and this is really for experienced folks, we, we uh, you know, that's something we could think about also. But we know your time is valuable and we don't want to schedule 
too many, too many different things either if there's not a, a purpose. I did want to mention also, uh, usually at the tear session, we do a beginner session on, on manuals. So again, if you, if you can't stay, um, thank you for coming. And for those of you, it looks like many of you will stay. We'll move into the last few reports, and then I will do that, my little song and dance about flex. <laughs> All right, we'll talk about the CMMOA report right now. Um, it uh, is continuing education student report. Uh, again, reflects the students enrolled as of the official census date and continuing ed courses. Um, the uh, student demographic data is collected. Uh, contact hours generated by the students are reported in different categories. Um, total contact hours on the A must be within 500 contact hours of the total contact hours reported on the C. Uh, this is an end of semester report. Um, and the, uh, the data is used in the accountability system. And again, any con uh, CTC report where continuing ed student information is, is required. Um, there's the report. Uh, the CBMO OC, which is the continuing education class report. Again, uh, classes reported must include all specially approved education continuing ed courses uh, and courses which are called, we refer to as local need, and courses listed in the continuing education section of the Workforce Education Course Manual, or WECM as sometimes we'll call it. Uh, we collect information about the classes taught, the contact hours, location, instructor, et cetera, uh, enrollments at census date, and end of course and non-funded are produced. Um, and the total, again, the total contact hours on the C must be within 500 contact hours of those reported on the A. End of semester report. Uh, this data is used in formula funding calculations, uh, and the data is used in the accountability system. And there's Neil. Uh, the marketable skills achievement report um, will include marketable skills achievement or MSA awards granted to students in active coordinating board approved programs during the fiscal year. Uh, this is a credit program of 9 to 14 SCH or a workforce continuing education program of 144 to 359 contact hours. An annual report and the data is used in the, account, in the accountability system and any reports where MSA information is required. And I do want to add for that, we do not include them when we're counting uh, certificates. I know in some states they think of marketable, they, they'll have certificates. We do not include those awards when we count certificates. Um, and I think that's important to know. We also had a question come in on the M, if you're okay, Doug, okay. with that. It says, currently multiple awards are picked up on our CBM OOM and institutions are submitting the report like that. Okay, maybe I didn't get there. On the OOM, current multiple awards are picked up on our reports. So, oh, I think this is from a, it's from a district. Now it makes sense. So from a district, they're saying the institutions are submitting the report to them like that. How does the coordinating board choose which award to count? Hmm. Now, I'm not sure what they're thinking about in terms of counting because they can report multiple awards, correct? I believe so. Um, so in terms of counting, we don't, they're not part of success points for counting. Award. We don't include uh, marketable skills for success points. They're not included for our completion, uh, for our success goal for closing the gaps. They're not going to be included in our completion goals for our new 60 by 30 text plan, which those of you who are going to TACRA will get to hear me present about tomorrow. Um, so in terms of counting, generally, you know, sometimes we count awards, we're just counting students who earned, earned an award. So if we were, you know, reporting out on something about marketable skills, or how many students earned them, you know, we'd count the students once, but generally, I guess we would count, uh, or where we show them in accountability, we do count however many marketable skills awards are reported to us. So if that is about what shows in accountability, I believe they're all included. And you can click on the I definition button in accountability to see if that's the case. But I'm pretty sure, and I'll double check that now. Okay, question? Uh, yes, um, we, it's a, we're a banner school, and the reports actually populate with multiple uh, marketable skill awards. Okay. Those reports are submitted as is. And I know that we're not the only school that does that. It doesn't error out on the report. And my question is, if we were trying to really clean up our reports and, and go by the guidelines on the manual and only report one, 
which one is there one Get marketable it. skill award oh, that we should count over the other? And if we don't aren't doing that, how does the coordinating board actually select the one in their count? Is it just a number? And I'm sorry, I might have missed the answer. I was chasing the mic. Oh, no, that's no. fine. And and I think I need to go back and look a little more carefully at what we ask for for the marketable skills. As I said, we don't use it for too many purposes, but we do. I think we have some place where we add them up, and we do ask that I guess that just one is included. I know it is used, for example, we have folks in Accelerate Texas programs, and sometimes we'll match, you know, data given to us by the people in those programs against our Marketable Skills Award, just to make sure the people in those programs are being reported to us with the awards that the, the program staff is telling us they're, they're being awarded with when they report the data separately. Um, you know, so I would say in terms of prioritizing, certainly if you have someone who's in an accelerated Texas program, that would be a good example for, you know, report that marketable skills award to us on the M uh, over something that maybe wasn't part of a, an organized program like that. But um, I will go back and look at that and we can and we can think about priorities. I did want to, and, and when I present the plan, I will mention we, we, we talked about this um, with the accountability groups. We, we have a marketable skills goal as part of our plan. It is not related to this award in, in any kind of direct way. And I'll talk about that more when I present the plan at, at TACRO. But we've even talked about maybe we need to change the name to make to, to ensure that we don't have confusion. Uh, but these are the awards. Again, they're voluntarily, I believe, reported to us. Is that correct, Doug? Or does everyone report? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Not everybody reports Not them everybody to reports them to us. And they're these th those small awards. Uh, in some states, they have certificates at this, at, you know, with these few hours. But that's not the case in Texas. And um, generally, we add certificates to counts. Yes. Success point. Success point question. Yes. Ooh. I should maybe know this already, but um, I was—is there a, a list of of what all the success points items are? Oh, we have lots and lots of information about success points, and I can give you great detail on that. Um, the best place to go is to go online into our accountability system, okay. and if you click on. Um, I think it's under measures and definitions, and Janet is actually going online now. There is a bullet that says success points, and you can click on that, and there's a, there's some different background materials, and one of them is a flow chart. And we have a flow chart that will actually walk you through, and we have explanatory materials that walk that where you can see all of the different success points, uh, what the weighting is for those success points, and it even has information about how they're calculated. Um, so that detail is there. We also show just how many points by institution in accountability. You can click on just the main points. It doesn't have as much, it doesn't have the definitions, but you can also go in and accountability and just see how many points did my institution get, and you know, during the last um, during last year and the year before. So I don't know, are we able to get there? Because I can quickly. Oh, Jana was opening something else up for me for my next part. But in any case, just catch me. I'll be happy to. I'll be happy to show you exactly where that is. But it's in accountability. If you click again on measures and definitions at the top of the main accountability page, you will see that. Jana, is it possible for you to get take me to accountability without? Maybe minimize that, and I'll just come over and show you. Here we go. There's mics everywhere. Okay, so if you if you get to our main beta, data page, which is the www.txhighereddata.org, then you want to look under online applications and select accountability. So here I am. I'm selecting accountability. It's I'm glad alphabetically it's first. It makes it easy to find. Okay, when you go into accountability, there's a couple things you can do. First of all, if you just want to see your points on the main page, on the right at the bottom, you'll see success points. You can click on that, and here's all the different points, and you can select an institution, wherever you want to go, and you can see how many success points uh, were awarded. And this is, these are the weighted success points. One thing about success points, it's important to remember that there is weighting. So for example, you get two points for a degree that's earned versus getting one point for a student getting to 15 hours. So they're all listed here. 
there's readiness, completion of 15 or 30 hours, transfer, successfully passing, completing a first college level course, degrees and certificates, and then there's a little extra bump for critical fields. But if you want more detail, and one thing you can also do here is you can hover over the eye, and there's some more explanation there about how they're calculated. But in addition to that, you can go back up and go into measures and definitions here. So again, I'm, I'm going at the top of the first page, measures and definitions, success points calculation details, and here we have a data flow. This is the first, and this kind of walks through all the data, and then we have this wonderful flow chart. So you can kind of see, all right, how, where are the points and how are they calculated? It'll talk, it gives you information about, um, generally snap, we use snapshot data for success points, but we do use a, something that's cohort-based um, when we do the, uh, the readiness. So hopefully that's, that will get you started. And if you have more detailed questions, we actually have logic flow documents that we've done for some of the calculations. And we provide our SAS code to anybody who wants it related to success points if you actually want to see in great detail. So we've tried to be as transparent as possible to make sure institutions have an understanding of how these, how these work, especially because it's related to funding. Okay, well let me just jump in now and do flex if that's okay. We'll quickly, I'll quickly try to answer the flex question and then we'll, we'll conclude the presentation after any final questions and then anyone who wants to stick around and learn more or ask more, they're welcome to do so. Um, so I'm going now to, if you can see, we're in the appendices. I'm selecting flexible entry appendix P. So does everyone know how to get here? You've been in the appendices for the manuals? Okay. So let me just, if I minimize this, can I minimize this by, okay. Okay, so here's a flex entry table. We did this a while back, but it all should still, should still be applicable. And w these are just examples. So what you need to think about is if you're thinking about something that isn't a fall course, it's a spring course, just change everything up by one semester and you'll have your answer in terms of something that happens at different times. And the exception to this would be what we learned today about the CBM 008 and the summer reporting. So that's something to keep in mind. So we'll, you'll see, for example, for the CBM 001, the only possible coding for flex is a one or a blank. And that's because this is a beginning of semester report and if you're telling us something is flex entry on that, you're saying this, this student did not start by the census date, so I'm giving you this information in the following semester. Okay, if we're looking at our end of semester reports, for example, the two and the S and the OE1, we're gonna have a situation where some students, and for, for example on the two, we, we tell you to leave flex entry blank if the, the course finished by the end of the semester, and I, I had to correct what I did before. On the S, we tell, we tell you to tell us it's a flex entry one, so I guess so we know to look for that on the, on the one and the four coming in the next semester. Um, so generally, we, we do differentiate on the end of semester reports between a flex entry one and a flex entry six. The sixes we added when we got these end of semester reports when the S and the OE1 came in so that you can tell us this is a course that started on a census date, um, for example, and spanned into the next semester or started after the census date and spanned into the next semester. This is not a course that started within the same semester that it finished. Um, so this is a good example on the two. If you have a course that starts after the census date and it ends in the current term, you just leave flex entry blank. Um, a course that starts in the, after the census date ends in the current term on the S, it's going to be a flex, a flex entry one. It's not spanning semesters. Um, but if you have a course that starts after the census date and ends in the following spring, that's when you start to see those sixes show up. Those are the courses that are the spanned courses that we use the six code to tell the difference. Um, so I hope this is a little bit helpful and, and you can walk through with the different examples because in earlier reports, just traditional, we, traditionally, like the four, we had FE instead of a one or a six. So we didn't change that. So people had to recode. We just left that FE. And one reason we made this table is because it does get confusing to think about the different types of flex entry. So generally think about it in terms of, um, for the beginning of the semester reports, you're just telling us if it's flex entry because you weren't able to get that information to us by the census date because the course started after that, 
or was scheduled after that. Uh, for the end of semester courses, if they finish in that same, sem for the end of semester reports, if they finish in that same semester, you're either leaving it blank or telling us it's a one, it's all done. Or if it's spanning semesters in any way, you're telling us it's a six. So again, I don't want to go into every possible example, but I wanted to make sure people are aware of this because the flex entry, um, it gets challenging. I think once you sort of figure out the main pattern, it's not too bad. But we did put these examples out here because of uh, we wanted folks to understand the differences. Okay. So any other any questions about flex? Yes. Oh, let me bring you a microphone. Or someone can. Um, my question goes back to the sort of the root definition of um, how to determine whether a class needs to be flex. And it talks about that a class, when the class is organized, um, class is organized when students have registered and have paid or arranged, yes. you know, payment. Um, so is that analysis done at the class level or is because I'm foreseeing potentially uh, some students are going to be in there and paid before and perhaps some students registering after the official census. So what is the recommendation? Should we just... Doug's going to tackle that one. Well, <laughs> thanks. Or I can't. I can if you well, like I, to. Well, if, if, is this a course uh, that is kind of online and people can start prior and, and then start after? Or so uh, today, cur to date, we have a, uh, our, the situation is that they they start at a specific time, basically mid fall, for for example. So there may be October fifteenth in that range, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the students probably do meet the qualification t for it to be a, a regular reported as a regular course, but we foresaw that. Um, it's very likely and very possible that we could have some stragglers that really do come into the mix after the fact. And so we, it, it seemed dangerous to us to have this mix going on. Yeah. And so I, what is the recommendation? Well, I, know, I mean, from what I've heard, um, you know, if the student registers late for the class, I mean, you're just not going to get formula funding for it after the you know, after the yeah, you can't date. split. You can't just tell us, oh, some of the students are flex in this class and some aren't. So I'll get the formula funding for the students who register late because I'll report them as flex in the next semester. Because it's going to be a problem on the four. If you've got a, you're reporting the four to us for when the class was scheduled. You know, in that right. fall, you're going to tell us on the four we've got this class going, and you can't tell us. My understanding is you can't tell us the next fall that. Oh, well, I'm going to just add people to that class that I already reported to you, but these are flex people. You either have to tell us, oh, we had a flex class that started in the fall, but we didn't report it in the fall, correct? Or we had the class start in the fall. It's my understanding you can't split a course across two semesters and report the part of the same course as flex and not. Am I correct there? Or is that yeah, you really shouldn't, but I guess, the, I guess um, just to make sure I'm understanding, so did, is the course flex anyway? Did it start after the census date of the semester? It definitely yes. does. The actual, uh, it's within within our, our system. We have sessions within our the term, and it definitely is like a, the la, uh, we have a seven week at the beginning of the session and then a second seven week session that is, that are our, what we've been counting as flex, but I guess I'm just kind of looking for confirmation is the way we've been approaching that uh, the the safest and most correct way to do it. So in the, so you've got students. I mean, <clears throat> so you're you've got the class and it's and is it already meeting and then people are then registering late for it and allowing to come in late. Is that correct? No, no. Uh, it's it's a lot of the students may be registered for that second second seven week session. Perhaps they are uh, registered b by the official census date early on and, and are meeting the qualifications, but I don't think they all are. So, and, but the, and the class is, but the class is not started yet. It's correct? not started. 
um, and the students, um, the rest of the students, though, the ones that are that are not at census date, they've not. I mean, they're they're still allowed to register for the class, and yes. the class goes on. I, I would say I, you would put all of the students in a flex class, and then report them in the next yeah, semester. Yeah, okay. that, that was that would be my response too. I think okay. to. Otherwise, if it is just stragglers, like Doug said, it would be okay to lose, you know, then you're not going to get the funding for those couple additional students that might come in. But you would have that in a class maybe that started before the census date, too. But if, if you really feel like you're going to have students, there will be some students who come in, you know, who register it before, before the class starts, but after the census date. You want to get credit for all those students, and we really don't want to have split reports coming in. I, I could see problems on the eight. I could see problems in a lot of ways if you've got a class that you're – telling us on the four you've got this class and then you're reporting the same exact class. It's not a different class. It's the same class, but you're just telling us additional students. I think that would be problematic in terms of a Is lot of the things that we do with the data for formula funding. Are you possibly funding. talking about an open entry, open exit class? Well, or that's, that's kind of what I class? was, yeah, that's kind of what I was talking about at first that I thought that's what she might have been where they say, you know, during this semester you can start at any time. Um, and uh, and what we've advised people is that anyone who starts the class prior to the to the census date um, of the semester should be in one section, and then the rest of the students that start that start after the census date should be in a second section. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could carry that forward if you wanted to set it up as two separate sections, What the example you were giving. Then the problem is that you might just have one or two students, and in terms of what that means for your facilities use and those reports, you know, showing with one student in a section when really they were all in the same class sitting in the same room at the, for the same amount of time, you know, I... I guess it would be a possibility, but I'm concerned that... These are typically that, online. Yeah, no, okay. those are online, and I think that multiple exit entry is okay in that case, but I, I think maybe, yeah, it probably would be best to just call them call them flex, and then you know you're going to get everyone, and it'll be, it'll be uh, reported accurately for funding and for our purposes. So, yeah, please, please do that. Okay. Anything else? You've got us here as a captive audience. You've, I'm, I'm really impressed that so many of you are still here. So thank you. You're, you're all very dedicated. This was a, it was a long stretch of time um, without a break, and we did power through a lot. Yes, Jamie. Oh, that is an excellent question. I'm glad you asked it. Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, but we don't know what, and so we're actually we're going to we are going to need. Uh, and the, the question was about tracking competency-based education. We what we have now is we do have some competency-based programs that are going on out there, um, but they are basically structured so that they're still kind of around a course, so that the competencies have been crosswalked to a course. We have behind the scenes we have provided some some coding options for institutions that are doing that, so we can collect the data. You're probably aware that there was a pilot there there is a pilot going on with South Texas College and A and M Commerce, and you know there's some other places, and we and if you are doing something and it's around a course, you can get in touch with us and we'll give you that special instruction. Um, we're probably getting close to the point where we'll, we'll put that in the manual so folks will know about it, but we just wanted to sort of see how the coding worked and people need to understand they need you know, they need to get the proper SAS permission, I mean, the, the um, SACS permission, everything else if they're going to move to this. What's happened now, though, is we are now aware there are some institutions through a grant who are doing competency-based where it is not going to be directly affiliated with the course. And so we know we're going to need to have a new report. And we have already started thinking about what that might look like. We have a person in our uh, area that works with innovation, policy and innovation, who's been already gathering some folks together to talk about competency-based education. Some of you might have been pulled in on those phone calls, and I said, make sure you ask them to bring reporting officials um, because... And I think moving forward, you know, we'll probably have an agenda for one of those calls with that group to, to talk about reporting because we are going to need something new and we want your feedback about what's going to be most appropriate for tracking, tracking, you know, comp tracking competencies that don't tie back to courses. It's pretty easy when you tie back to courses in terms of reporting. It becomes a whole new world if you don't. Well, we, the tying back to classes, though, you get to the point where 
are they considered internet or are they considered special internet? You know, you're, we're going to need to be able to distinguish because they are kind of online type courses for some. Yes. And that kind and of thing. And probably we could, you know, put out some instructions for, hey, are you doing competency based? Here's what it can look like and here's some ideas to help with reporting. And that group could even talk through some of that. Um, but we are, as I said, we are going to also need to have some kind of new report. I think the formula funding committees, Paul, will probably, when they meet, they'll probably talk about this. We're anticipating a charge for um, the formula advisory committees to discuss competency-based education. They, they had it as a charge last time. Their recommendation was, as Julie said, that you uh, convert the modules and align the them courses. to courses and report the courses on the full report once the module, once the student has completed all the modules for a particular course. Right. And that's the way funding's working right now. Okay. The other question I have, and since you're still here, Paul, because I wanted to confirm, and um, on our 008 for community colleges, I'm pretty certain we're reporting the year's salary for our full-time faculty because we get an error that says this person's making over uh, a certain amount of money. I'm, I'm almost certain, Tina. Yeah we, are. yeah, we report the whole year salary, and you had it doubled, so it was kind of confusing me. Because on our report, we report their year salary if they're full-time faculty, and and we get the error report like they make over seventy-five thousand dollars, or they make more than eighty thousand dollars, and it comes out as a warning, and we have to go review those. So I just wanted to make sure because you had it doubled, and I didn't want mine doubled because I have enough trouble. Um, I'll have to look into that and see what we're doing with it. Yeah, we haven't changed a lot of those things in years and years. Yeah. So we, it may be that finally the salaries have finally crept up enough that it's triggering those warnings, but it's just that's just the salary it is. Yeah, it is. Okay. But, I mean, I just we have to review them all. And, yeah. And I'm almost certain it's the full year salary because that's what you're saying. If you're making over a certain amount... And we have to go in and review all those. So I just wanted to make that clear since you had doubled on there. I, I didn't want... Yeah, what I'm doubling is not the same thing as, as what's going on in the edit report. Those are two separate... Yeah, but I mean, what I'm reporting factors. in the field, though, I think, is, is the, the full year salary. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll look into it and see if that's not an incorrect slide. Okay. I'll double check. And we also report their full year contract. Yeah. It's what we it we've always done it that yes, way. Full year do. contract and full year salary. You definitely need to report their full year contract. I've run into that error and had to have corrected. Tom? You talked about someone who's uh, spearheading the discussion on reporting competency-based instruction. Mm -hmm. If we want to plug into that discussion and know who to contact, who is that? Judith Sebesta. Say again? Judith is her first name. And it's S-E-B-E-S-T-A, Sebesta. And she's here at the coordinating board. And I can also let her know that you might be interested. I, I think your institution is one of the ones. Is your institution one of the ones that's involved? I know that, oh, yours is, Jamie? Yeah, there is, there is some kind of grant that's been awarded with special approval from the federal government to do, a, do some pilots. And they're not going to look, you know, typical in terms of what people are doing. So I, we're sooner rather than later, we're going to need to have a reporting in place for these competency-based um, programs. But I'm sure, as I'm sure most people understand, it's, with this, it's, it's pretty complicated in terms of SACS approvals and all those kinds of things. And I think certain institutions have permission to do things because it's part of a pilot. Um, but that's part of why we haven't included coding and in all of that, is we don't we don't want it to. We don't want the cart to lead the horse, so to speak, and have people think, "Oh, this is in reporting, so we can go ahead and do these things," um, because some of it is, you know, right now could could get you into trouble with the accreditors and all of that. So, uh, in any case, but we would love feedback as we do start to move through this. It's 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 a whole new world, and we thought NCBOs were hard, um, and and some of that's why we think it's a, a new report. You know, as much as we've been able to fit a square peg and try to fit a square peg into a round hole as things have changed. Uh, this is so different that I don't think we can fit it into our, our current manuals, our current reports. Yes. I have a question about the Hazelwood report and the CBM1. Um, we report the, um, the tuition exemption or the waiver code. 
Is that data uh, compared against the Hazelwood report? Um, it was at one time, but the Hazelwood report now rests with the Texas Veterans Commission. Okay. So um, they may, well, they'll probably just supply um, SSN. If we ever do any kind of a joint reporting, they'll probably just supply the SSNs to us and we'll pull what we have. Okay. On the web focus report, you know, we'll go out there and we'll click on, or I'll go out there and I'll click on um, the percentages of completion of our reports. And I, I notice on there it says days past due. Mm -hmm. Trying to understand, knowing that we submitted on time, what does that really mean? That, that was a... Um it was a pretty busy report out there. I, to tell you the truth, I still use what I think they call the classic report. There's a little button up there. The legacy report? Legacy, so that's, thank okay. you. Um, that's the one I typically use. Um, you know, the when the, when the um, programmer was doing it, they thought, well, it, it'd be good to, to show, you know, past, past due of, um, you know, of, of the due date. Um, you know, tried to kind of tell them, well, it's not really that way. You know, we give them six weeks, stuff like that. But um, we don't we don't look at it as anything bad or anything like that. So, I mean, are y'all is that not not yet? Right? Well, we've always had the ability to pull that if we wanted to, but um, so I, I wouldn't worry about it. I had a question about um, the number of times we submit reports lately because some technical difficulties on your end and some issues on our end. We have to submit, or even the fact that you have to submit them a couple times just to make sure you're in balance and the report, the edits reflect that. Um, one of the things I had heard before was that the CB would be taking note of the number of times we submit. So I was wondering what that is look, what you're looking at right now uh, in future audits, how is that going to be looked at? Well, in the past, when the SAO, State Auditor's Office, um, was tasked with auditing the institutions, I mean, that was part of the, that was part of the, the thing that they looked at. Um, you know, we could definitely advise them, you know, we had problems at this time, people were having to resubmit and all that. Now, the SAO doesn't do the audits anymore. Um, I haven't been asked for that information in probably four or five years. Um, typically, when somebody goes out to audit your institution, you know, they'll, uh, our internal audit staff asks the questions uh, do they have a new uh, reporting official there? Did they change um, software, you know, from Banner to Colleague or, or to Ginsbar or whatever? Um, that's, um, that's never asked of me. No. All right. So, so having a high number of submissions is not necessarily a negative thing. No, I don't think so. I mean, it's we've gotten to the point um, these days, you know, where, um, you know, I don't. I, I would probably argue that. Well, you know, if they get it back, and if y'all get it back, and you correct it and get it back in again, um, you know, that's not a bad thing. You know, you could wait. A whole week or two, I guess, and save it all up. But I mean, what good does that do anybody? Exactly. From the main, yeah, you know, we used to have to have a room about a quarter of this size just for the tapes we would get. <laughs> and it was a what was it about a week turnaround, right? I have a another kind of back to the basics question. Okay. Um, uh, just taking a step back, looking at the manual, all the details, um, the the uh, sort of definition of a postback student, mm -hmm. um, someone who's not admitted to a graduate program and also not enrolled in a an undergraduate program. Right. So where does that leave a second back student? What, how should they be classified? Oh, oh, second baccalaureate. Yes. Yeah, they're just a they're just a yeah, it's, yeah. You you need to go ahead and uh, so 
we, we have had this question a couple of times. Um, so the student goes back for a second baccalaureate. Um, you're probably going to, they're probably going to be classified, well, you should probably classify them as the number of semester credit hours. I, I don't, let me ask this, can you, when they go back in, you know how many more hours they need to get their degree. Is that fairly, I mean, is that easily found? Could you classify them as a junior? I, I would have to really have a discussion internally. Uh, it's, it's not something we've talked about uh, right. you know, up to now. I mean, typically we would like to have them uh, you know, reported as kind of what they are to get back to their second degree, whether it be a junior or senior or whatever. Wow. Um, how many hours you know, you've allowed them even though the they already have a bachelor's degree. Yes. So we're going because back to it, for, senior. For, undergra for undergraduate limit, once they get their bachelor's degree, they'll go back to zero hours, but then they, they'll they start building those undergraduate hours back up towards the limit again. Um, it's doubtful they're ever going to get there, but you never know, I guess. So they would be, once again, subject to the 30, 45 hour yes. rule? Yes. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Doug, I'm just going to interrupt for a minute. I am I'm being called into a meeting. Um, I can come back down hopefully shortly, but if there were any questions for me that people, anything else that you think you'd like me to be here to answer? Okay, well, you've, you've got Doug. He's, he's the answer man. And <laughs> I'm here all night. <laughs> again, thank you. Thank you all. I will come back down. You may all be gone by, by then, but thank you all so much for coming. I hope, it was, I hope it was helpful, and again, you can continue to ask questions if you'd like. Thank you. We have any more? Or everybody's just leaving with okay, Julie, huh? <laughs> Once I'm gone, that's what, that's what's right. The point? Party's over. Julie's gone. What's the point? <laughs> yeah. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs>